And I'm, I have to tell you, I've been a Christian for like seven or eight years at that time, and I, I didn't even, I didn't step on nothing. I didn't step on nothing. That Father, you've done all that needs to be done. And Father, you have said all that needs to be said. So Holy Spirit, we just give you, we give you this time. We give you all of the glory. I just pray for the authority of heaven. The authority of heaven come. The authority of heaven come. Help our hearts to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So a few weeks ago, I did the announcements, and we were talking about how terrible it is to forget people's names. And, uh, and as soon as we left here, I forgot that dude's name. All right? And I asked my wife, I said, what was that dude's name? And she said, I don't know. So we figured out a way to remember Claudel's name. She has a brother-in-law with a sister named Claudette. And I, we finally got there after a very long process. So if you have any complicated names, I need to figure out something really creative. So Brad told me I had two hours, so I brought a really big bottle of water. He asked me to share my testimony, and I have shared my testimony at mostly men celebrate recovery groups, um, which is my comfort zone, I guess. And we do... Um, something similar uh, up at the cigar shop that I opened a few years ago after arguing with God, which is part of the rest of the story. Um, but uh, I've only shared in a couple of large gatherings with men and women, and uh, so it's a little different for me. But I guess there's something to be said about that because God and my wife play the same game. They let me think that I'm in charge and everything is my idea. So. And at the end of the day, they all, it always works out the way they want me to. Um, I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of it. And just like Brad's wife, she always says, I know. And that's just their way of saying, you screwed up, and I know, and it's too hard for you to say, I'm sorry, so I'm gonna say, I know, and you're gonna say, no, you don't know. Anyways, uh, we, I grew up in Maine. We moved here. Now, let's, I'll, let me stay with the Maine thing. And I'm not going to spend a lot on the beginning of, our, of my life uh, because it was such a train wreck. And if I use any words that you think are inappropriate, anything less than an F-bomb is probably, I'm not using it to be offensive, okay? I'm just saying that. Um, grew up on the streets, uh, was skipping school in first and second grade. Obviously, you could tell I didn't like school. Um, by the time uh, I was six or seven years old, my parents had split up several times. We lived in a small shoe factory town, um, mill town, and uh, that was pretty much what everybody did there. Most of the people in our community were from Canada. They had all come down from uh, Montreal uh, over into the border of Maine, and so that's, that was our, our family structure. Every Christmas uh, was at my Meme and Pepe's house, and uh, six uncles, some were in transition of being married, some were in Vietnam, some were divorced, but they were always drunk, always somebody was in the crying jag, there was always a fight, there was never any 911, so somebody would run out and pull the little fire alarm down on the telephone pole, and that's how our Christmases went for many years. Um, our household was somewhat dysfunctional. I have a brother that's a year younger than me, I have a sister that's a few years younger, and me being the oldest seemed to see all the things that were inappropriate in a relationship and a marriage and uh, the infidelity. Uh, you know, back then, if you bounced a check, the police showed up at your house to, to find out why. And a lot of times it was a surprise to my dad. Um, but I can remember uh, some of their breakups, some of their big fights. And then I can remember some of the good times where they would have friends over and um, the guys would sneak downstairs supposedly to share and show the latest tool that the other guy had gotten. But that's where they stashed all the beer. So I grew up thinking, this is a fun game. You, the wives are upstairs, we're playing cards, we're taking intermission. And they're going downstairs getting wasted. And then they come up and the lady's like, why are you guys so drunk? And they're like, well, no, we, how many beers do you have? The answer was always two. I grew up knowing the answer was two beers, no matter how many beers anybody had. And... Uh, so I kind of grew up that way. So I quit school when I was 15. My dad told me I was going to be a street sweeper. And uh, that kind of set a, 
a path of destruction for me to prove him wrong. Um, and in a lot of ways, um, became very dysfunctional. So, was starting to work at 15, 14, I worked in a restaurant. By 15, I was in the shoe factories where my dad had worked. And uh, I guess I didn't understand how self-destructive it was to want his approval as a young man. Uh, it wasn't until I was saved and heard a, a pastor. I used to listen to a lot of AM radio stations and uh, this pastor said, you don't need your earthly father's approval, you have your heavenly father's approval, but that was when I turned 40. So in between there was as much cocaine, as much alcohol. I got married at uh, 19 years old. I already knew the names of the, the children that we were gonna have. There wasn't any discussion about it. Um, I had started uh, running a couple of departments in the shoe factory. My dad, at the peak of his career before they got divorced was a uh, superintendent and I had always said in the back of my head I would uh, prove to him that I was going to do better than he would and that I would do it sooner than he did and I was not going to be a street sweeper. Looking back I understand being born, I'm, I'll be 60 next year so being born in the 60s was like uh, that was like reverse psychology that they I think that he thought he was going to motivate me which he did but I became very dysfunctional and to the point where I kept a, a bottle of alcohol in my drawer at the factory that I ran, I became the youngest superintendent. Uh, I was the uh, vice president of manufacturing by the time I was 24 years old. Uh, all the shoe factories up in New England had closed and uh, I was faced with having to relocate. So a company uh, actually still in business today, they were known as William Brook Shoe Company, but they make Rocky Boots. Uh, bought our shoe factory and relocated it to Puerto Rico and, and the Dominican Republic. So I went down there. Um, at that time I had been divorced. We had three children. Uh, my daughter was uh, just born and uh, had two boys that were six and seven. And I got divorced and um, relocated to the Dominican Republic. The alcoholism and drug addiction became worse. Uh, set up these two factories, had everything going, and uh, it finally got to a point where they, they saw what a train wreck I was, and they said, you know, you really, you probably need to go home and get your life straight, and we like what you're doing for work, but you're a mess. So I came home, and I'm not going to spend a lot of other time on the rest of the, the beginning of the family dynamics. Um, my children live with my ex-wife. I came home, still drinking, still drugging. Um, my Mom and stepdad picked me up at the airport in Boston, and I lived with them up uh, on, up in western New, uh, Maine. And uh, worked several different jobs over some time, and uh, ended up uh, getting into a band at the time uh, by accident, and started singing and, and traveling around, and that was just uh, worse uh, for what I was already going through. So after. Uh, four years of being divorced. Um, I think by this time I was 28. 1989, I had bought a brand new uh, Trans Am because that was the thing to do. Uh, didn't have insurance. I called the guy at the credit union and said, hey, I can't afford the insurance. You want me to bring it back or park it? He said park it. I drove it. Drove it that night and uh, rolled it over five times on my way home. There was no fight. There was it was just, and it was a road that I knew because there's an SPCA right on the corner and I never negotiated the corner according to the state trooper. And uh, so I was walking out through the woods and I remember saying, because I was a very arrogant, prideful person um, and I found all my self-worth and my identity and my esteem through my work. So I remember saying, okay, God, if you're really up there, and growing up as a kid, there was no grid for God in our family. I think I went to a Catholic school for, for maybe a year, and uh, then we went to uh, regular uh, public schools through our middle school until I quit my end of my freshman year. So going into the 10th grade, yeah, I quit ninth grade. Anyways, and I was known as Napoleon Dynamite before Napoleon Dynamite was ever made famous. My daughter still shares a picture of me that looks like him. So any of that bullying stuff that you guys think this new generation online is dealing with doesn't hold a candle to the bullying of a Napoleon Dynamite with black rimmed glasses, 
160 pounds, well, probably 110 pounds. Um, and that, so that was all part of the, the childhood stuff, and I had to throw that in there because I'm transitioning into the next part. So I uh, had no grid for God. I, I obviously had a lot of bullying, a lot of um, resentment and anger. I'd never been in a fight. Uh, my dad always told me if I fought with somebody that I would kill them and go to prison the rest of my life, so that one worked. The street sweeper, not so much. Um, and. Uh, so I'm basically out of a career. I've only known one job. I'm in the band and uh, working, uh, selling cars or something. I forget what I was doing at the time. And uh, I remember um, going out that night and coming back, rolling a car over and walking through the woods and saying, okay, God, if you're really up there, I swear on my three kids' lives, I will never drink again if you get me out of this without going to jail. And uh, by the time I made my way back around in the woods, because I was walking that way, and my car was literally right here on its roof, and I was just disoriented and obviously injured. Lost my glasses, blind as a bat. Come back out to the road. By then, all the ambulance and police cars are there, and uh, this huge state trooper guy comes up and asks me if I was alone, and um, I said, yes, sir. I said, you might as well arrest me now. I just finished. We were playing at the Poland Springs Inn, which was a highfalutin, uh, weekend getaway that everyone from Connecticut would come up to the mountains of New Hampshire or Maine and, and stay at this place. And uh, so I told him I had 10 rum and cokes like in the last hour. I don't remember what I had before that, but I had plenty in the last hour and that I should be going to jail. And uh, he had me sit in his car and he says, uh, get your butt to the hospital. Don't ever let me see you drinking and driving again. And so that's always served me well in recovery because we all go through those things where we say, man, God, if you clean this mess up, if you get me out of this, I will never go back to this again. And, uh, and, and it may not be the same way you went back to it, but unless you're truly in a relationship with Christ, it's almost impossible to refrain from going back into those traps in some form or fashion. If you're a cokehead, the enemy might come at you and the next thing you know, you're like, man, I never experienced any addiction to porn or any lustfulness and all of a sudden that's coming at me. Or if you're an alcoholic, it could be weed, whatever, but it's always something when you're an addict or someone that's got my personality at least. I go to the casino and I, if I go with $500, I'm not leaving until it's either all gone or all the bells and whistles are going off on that machine because that's not why I'm going there, you know? Um, so anyways, um, he tells me that and I go home and, uh, you know, after I had four or five broken ribs, a broken collarbone and everything healed up and within three months, uh, I was ready to go back out and I was supposed to be singing that particular night borrowed one of my stepdad's cars, went down to the store, grabbed a six pack, and um, when I cracked the first beer to drink the six on the way, he said, I don't normally public speak. I really don't speak much at all other than one-on-one. -on -one. And I don't like to hear myself publicly speak, speaking, like Brad, he's a natural. Um, so I would have to be drunk before I started singing. And I always thought I sounded amazing. The drunker I was, the better I was. And those guys were like, dude, you're an idiot. You suck and you need to stop drinking. And every night it was a battle for seeing who was gonna get my keys and, and uh, other than that one night that they missed and I rolled over. So um, I cracked that beer and that promise that I had made flashed before my eyes. I wasn't saved. I hadn't asked him into my life, but he reminded me. There was something that happened to one of my kids. I wouldn't have been able to live with that. So I threw the six pack out. I think I may have drank a few other times. I used to think that that was the very first and last time, but I don't think it was, because I think when I first met Colleen, I was having some beers at a campground or something. But anyways, uh, so I'm still singing. I meet her uh, at some, uh, Legion Hall that we were playing at, and uh, then she disappeared, and she came to a big club that we were playing at, and I remember being on a cordless mic singing, and I was obviously drunk. I was on the floor walking around singing, and I saw her, and I said something romantic like, are we dancing or what? And she like, no, and she left. <laughs> so, 
That line doesn't work, guys. It does not work. So she showed up at a later date at another place, and we met uh, again, and I asked her if she wanted to go get something to eat, so we went to Denny's, which was the only place open at 2 in the morning, and we ate, and we started talking, and for the next, I don't know, three, four, five weeks, uh, we would be on the phone. I lived 45 minutes away um, from where she did. She was working at a hospital in the city in Lewiston, and uh, so we started talking for hours a day, and uh, finally we ended up moving in together. So the first half of the story I always say is uh, BC, before Christ. Second half of the story is AC. And uh, so now we move into uh, living together, starting a life, and we're about six months into our relationship. And um, obviously when you're in recovery, they teach you about hurts, habits, and hangups. And we had all of those. She had been through a terrible marriage. and abuse and divorce and all that stuff and um, so we were living together and it's just existing basically both working um, and uh, had this knockdown drag out fight um, in 1990 we've been living together at her apartment I moved out of my the house that I was renting and moved in with her she had a much nicer vehicle than I did. I was using some piece of garbage after totaling my brand new car and she had this uh, Ford Ranger two-seater with all the ground effects kit, little five-speed. So I thought we were living large. I hardly could fit in it, but it was good. <laughs> That's not even the funny part. The funny part is we used to put the three kids in the front seat of that with us. So, we have this knockdown, drag out fight, and I'm, I just have realized again that I am the biggest train wreck on the planet, and uh, I just messed up another relationship. So she's packing her stuff. She was going to call the police, and for some reason she didn't. And uh, she was in there packing her stuff. It was close to the time she should be going to work at 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And uh, I'm flipping through the channels, and there wasn't many choices back then. This is 30 years ago, and there's a uh, Charles Stanley was on uh, whatever the network it was like uh, the family channel where the touch by an angel and all those shows used to be on and he's at the very end of his message where he says if you're sick and tired of the mess you've made in your life and you're totally and unconditionally willing to surrender your life to Christ and say this prayer with me and I said that prayer I remember thinking I don't have any other choice because I've been doing it on my own all these years it's not working and so I said that prayer she came out and asked if I'd said the prayer and I said yeah I said did you and she said yeah and I said what do we do now and she says we need to get married and I'm like what we've been living together for <laughs> six months and all of a sudden we got to get married like and uh, so she went to work that night it was still kind of a blur. I really didn't know what had happened, but I knew when I said that prayer instantly, it was a weight of relief off my shoulders. I had never felt. When I went through my divorce, for the only divorce, the first divorce, I remember laying in bed, knowing that the relationship was over and that helpless, hopeless feeling that if I just had a clean slate, it was something I could do to change it. And it was the most loneliest place on the planet to know that you, you wanted to make a change, but you just didn't know how. And that night I knew how. And uh, so I did. And uh, she called me at seven the next morning, said, hey, meet me at this church. I found it in the phone book. <laughs> so we didn't know anything about churches other than a Catholic church because we'd both gone to a school year at one church. She went longer than I did. Um, so I got ready, went to this church, and <clears throat> that's kind of the beginning of our 30 years that uh, we walked into that church that morning. It was a, an Assemblies of God church, uh, about 200 people, and walked in, and they loved on us and, uh, and really wanted us to be there. And uh, so I asked to meet with the pastor afterwards and went in. I was still in the band at the time. I still didn't trust myself because I knew I'd either be looking at other women, I'd be bumming cigarettes because I had quit smoking and all the guys in the band smoked Marlboro Lights and I knew 
all the things that I would be led back into, and I couldn't, I couldn't do anything to change it. And I asked to meet with him, and so I went into his office the following week and uh, told him our situation, told him we were living together. He said, no problem, you can take the My Faith course. They had a couple that was in their 70s that were just amazing and loved on us and sewed into our lives. That, that They used to go to a park that had a pavilion and do the summer barbecues, and he would just sit there and sew into my life about reading Psalms 23 and what God had done in his life. And uh, so I go in to meet with the pastor, and again, no grid for God. So anything I say is true, no matter how stupid it really sounds. So we're walking to his office, and I says, look, here's my situation. I love these guys. I've been singing with them for five years. Um, I don't know how to get out of this, but if I don't get out of it, it's going to ruin another marriage. And he said, oh, yeah, no problem, Rick. He said, uh, I got the perfect answer. Now, we're in his office, and I'm waiting to see, like, some crystal ball that we're going to get over or do something. I really thought, and he said, yeah, I got the perfect answer. I said, what, what are we going to do? He said, we're going to pray. And I said, that, that sounds a little bit weak to me. Is that all you got? Me? <laughs> he said, that's all you need. He said, God knows those things that are harmful to you and not pleasing to him. So he said, let's pray. So we knelt, got at his coffee table. And when I share this with guys in recovery, you know, part of uh, our transition when we get saved, God does miraculous things. Some people get radically saved the way we did. Other people have been in the church all their lives. And, and I think sometimes for them it's maybe even more difficult because for me there was never a question in my mind. Once I was saved, I was saved. It was a radical transformation that I had nothing to do with and couldn't take credit for. But I knew my heart had been changed because I wanted to love and serve and do things for other people where that was never a case with me. I was the most selfish, self-centered, egotistical guy on the planet. Just, it was just terrible. And I had that revelation. I had that heart change. But uh, so we prayed and he told me, you know, you pray every day. When you say your prayers, you just ask God to remove that from you. And so, like, when I would share with guys in recovery, I would always use that as an example because there's some things that you pray for and he answers really quick. And then other parts of our story took many years. And uh, I'll give you an example of that. But for this one, it was three weeks later. Three weeks always seems to work for me. I think he usually gets to me in three weeks. <laughs> but that was the same thing with opening up the cigar shop after arguing three weeks. But um, I... Uh, said that prayer and I woke up on a Thursday morning, which was our practice night, and, uh, and I said, man, I'm done in the band. And I, it wasn't like he told me anything. I had this revelation inside that I was done and I wasn't going back and I called our drummer and I said, hey, Wayne, I'm, I'm getting done. And he, I said, I can't do this anymore. He's like, okay, so we're booked. And in the music industry, if you're a decent band and you get a New Year's gig, you normally make 400 bucks on a Friday and a Saturday. New Year's, you make like twenty-five to three thousand. So it was a very important thing to them. <clears throat> and uh, so he says, "Well, you're going to wait till New Year's, right?" And I'm like, "No, I'm done today." He's like, "You can't get done today. We're booked this New Year's, next New Year's, and you're the lead singer." And I said, "No, I'm I'm done today." I says, "And and I, I hate to do this, but I, if I don't, I know I'm going to ruin this relationship." So I left. That was the last time I went there. Um, uh, we started going to church, continued to go to church. Um, you know, the next uh, big story in church is because I'm such an idiot. And I'll, I'll just be like, saying something that doesn't make any sense. And my wife will just be like, okay, whatever. But every week, just like Brad does announcements, pastor will get up and do announcements. And every week, I mean, we'd only been going there like six months. And every week he's asking somebody to volunteer to drive this bus. And I remember telling her, 200 people here, surely one of these idiots is going to drive that bus, right? <laughs> and uh, it just wouldn't go away. It was the most ridiculous thing in the world. I'm like, what a bunch of freaking lambos. I mean, nobody's going to volunteer to drive this bus. And so the next week we show up, and I don't know, sometimes, God doesn't have to say a whole lot, but I always know what he's saying. I don't like it, and a lot of times I kick and scream about it, but I looked at Colleen, I was like, I think I'm the idiot that's supposed to drive the bus. <laughs> and so I started driving the bus. And uh, the kid that was training me was going in to do jail ministry. And he was like closest thing to Jesus that I had ever seen. This 
This guy was a carpenter. He was amazing. He had three kids. He had a wife. And I was sharing my testimony, brand new. I didn't even know how to share. I was just telling him what God had done. And he was weeping. He's driving the bus. I'm sitting in the... And it's a big bus. It's like from here to there with the door, with the big handle. It's a school bus. And uh, I didn't even know where we were going. I'm on the bus and telling my story. And he tells me he had been saved his whole life and uh, that he didn't, he didn't have a testimony. He said, man, I wish I had a testimony. I says, you do, because it can show someone like me that when you surrender your life to Christ, that he can sustain you from all those things in the world because you don't have to have the garbage that I lived through, the mistakes that I made. You've had a relationship and he has protected you and kept you from that for all your life. So what he thought was a great testimony for me, I was just sitting there in awe of him thinking, God, if you'll do that for me, I'll live like that for you. Oh, and, uh, so now we're going on the bus, and we're driving. I'm like, I wonder where we're going to go. And uh, figure we're picking up elderly people. And so uh, we went into a few developments. The next place we go into, I recognize, because it was the housing project that my three kids lived in. And uh, this is how cool God is. They weren't, they weren't allowed to go to church with us um, when we didn't have them. We had them almost every weekend, but there were some times that we didn't, and their mom didn't let them go to church. So all of a sudden, we're in the neighborhood, and they realize that's a church bus that dad's on. He's going to be driving, so they asked their mother. and So they ended up during that time, I don't know how long it was. And I think I burnt a lot of brain cells because my memory is usually not that great. But they were able to get on the bus every Wednesday night. Colleen taught my daughter with the missionettes uh, downstairs. And I taught the boys Royal Rangers, which is like the scouting thing. And uh, they were able to experience that. Um, so in this meantime, we've been married for a few years now and a couple years. And her sisters are all like, what's wrong with Rick? Can't that guy keep a job? Now, I'm sober. I'm the best worker that I know. And uh, showing up every day and every job I had, I would be fired. I mean, I was stone drunk and they never fired me. <laughs> and these guys are, I'm selling cars, I'm working for a computer payroll company, um, uh, working security at the hospital where she worked at overnights and then working day side jobs. And I can't keep a job. And I'm like, God, what is going on? And every time I come home and my wife's wisdom, she always had the answer. It's like, well, God just knows if... If you'll stay there till you retire, but he has something much bigger in store for you, so he keeps drying up the stream. And I'm like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and, uh, and I'd be weeping and broken and like, God, what is going on? I'm, I'm doing everything you want me to be doing. So it doesn't mean you become a Christian and all of a sudden your life gets really good. But uh, through that process, because I didn't have any education, and I literally was skipping school in the first and second grade, that's not a lie. I'd go downstairs, we lived in a third floor apartment, I'd argue with my mom long enough to get out to the bus stop, way at the end of the driveway until the bus went by, then I'd walk to school. I didn't walk to school, I walked to a store, took my 35 cent lunch money, bought an apple pie and a milk, and I'd go sit in the woods and watch them build this big huge mall. So, anyways, where was I? Oh yeah, that whole keeping a job thing. That was a really crappy time. So her sisters are questioning her, you know, what's going on? Rick can't keep a job and this and that. And I did, I bounced through a lot, but I was saying because of my education or lack of, I think God used all those seasons. The guy at the payroll company was a computer professor. And so during selling payroll services and drafting to gyms that I was dealing with, he taught me about computers, even though it was old computers. Um, Selling cars gave me some techniques, it's a lot that I didn't want to have, but some that I learned that were all right. And so I think he used all those things during that time, even though I didn't understand it or see it. And so now we're five or six years, we've been serving at this church. Our kids are going through the youth program and uh, I'm working out at this gym, uh, basically doing telemarketing so I can uh, work off my gym membership that we couldn't afford to pay because we were broke as dirt. When we got together, I had $40,000 worth of debt between that $17,000 car and $23,000 worth of child support. Colleen was making a lot more money than I was. 
and uh, I felt like a real schmuck, but um, our furniture in our apartment or house that we were renting all came from rent -a center and every few months it would end up at the pawn shop for a few weeks and then we'd pick it up and so that was kind of the beginning of our first 10 years. I mean, we had Super Bowl parties on the biggest TVs anybody had that were rented from rent -a center and uh, but we didn't know any better. It was, it was a, we had more joy in our life despite how poor we were and everybody around us was doing amazingly well and we were rejoicing in how well they were doing, buying new homes, building homes, and we were just in the, the happiest time. I always say it was a nightmare and I don't, I don't really mean that um, specifically to the marriage but to the time in our life from the baggage and all the healing. But God was doing amazing things in our lives uh, during that time. Uh, I was uh, got into the cleaning business. I was working for a company. Um, well, first I lost my last job. Then I had to get into the cleaning business because I that's the only other thing I knew. So I um, went to the landlord we rented a farm from, and he gave me an old 350 Econoline van, and I uh, went out and got a floor scrubber and a buffer, sold some accounts, and started building up a little business. And uh, meanwhile, Colleen still basically covering everything, working five twelves a week. And uh, we're praying, we're praying this whole time that we want the kids to come live with us. Um, that was our prayer to have the three children come live with us so we could take care of them and protect them. During that time, uh, buddies of mine that I was working at the hospital with were also on the police department, came in one night and said, hey, you need to go pick up your kids. Um, your ex says, uh, she went through a lot of different recoveries, rehabs, and would normally meet somebody from there, but they hadn't got enough in their healing or in their walk, so they were all a mess, a train wreck. And one guy was, her, typically it would be, they would live there during the summertime, and then they would be out when school started, and one guy took offense to that and was out uh, behind the projects threatening to kill her and the kids, and so I had to go get them. And they did come to live with us for a year, but then the judge sent them back uh, the following year, which was just a, the most hideous thing on the planet. And again, we're still praying. We're at church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Um, we were always there. Um, pastor would bring me a cassette every week, and now that I'm not drinking because I was sober, the only way I could sing was to travel all week and listen to this cassette till it was about worn out and I knew it perfectly because I'd have to get up here and close my eyes in order to be able to sing in front of the congregation. So we uh, were probably five or six years into our marriage and um, praying that they would come live with us. And someplace in that time uh, when I started that company, um, just out of necessity, out of survival, um, another company had approached me about contracting for them. And uh, so I was a subcontractor cleaning supermarkets and I was um, doing that for about a year. We're about six years into it. Um, on the seventh year, I, went, uh, I was working for the small company that I was with and uh, the guy that came in at, at, with the owner's wife who just got divorced and took over the business, uh, we, our, we were talking to our older son and he wanted to come live with us so he called his mom and uh, this is seven years, this is a, uh, we had a uh, court order one year for them to live with us and they go back and uh, all of a sudden my older son calls and says, hey mom, we think we want to come live with dad and Colleen so we can learn uh, how to do guy stuff like shaving and stuff like that. And, she said, okay, whatever you want to do. And so they came to live with us. We never went back to court. We never um, had to do anything other than pick their stuff up and they were living with us. And that, they started school in September. Um, I'm still working for this company before I transition to my own. And, uh, and the reason I need to bring that up is because I harbored a lot of resentment to that dude. Um, they, uh, the couple had got divorced that I've been working for for a couple years and I stayed on and uh, her boyfriend came in and started asking questions, started traveling with me, and I was the general manager of the company at the time. And it became apparent he was looking to take my job and get on board with the company. So it was within six months, it was November actually, it was going into Thanksgiving week, uh, he came in and laid me off. 
And I remember thinking, you slug. That's not what I said, but that's what I, I'm saying now. I will kill you, but I didn't say that either. And he gave me a ride home in my own company truck and said, hey, uh, you know, if you ever need a reference, let me know. And I am thinking, God, how would you even think this is possible? We ju we've been serving you uh, faithfully. Our kids just came to live with us in September, and now I'm without an income, and it's back on my wife. This is not even funny. And so out of necessity, that's when I went to our landlord and said, hey, I know we owe you two months' rent. Um, can you sell me a van? And he said, yeah. So we bought this crappy old 350 Econoline van that had more holes in the floor. I always wondered if my machines were going to fall through one day going down the highway. But uh, started, started that little company. And that's when God started to deal with me on, on pride because I thought, okay, this will be cool. I'll have a business card. I'll be the owner of my own company. And I just thought that was how it was supposed to be. And about a year later, this company that approached me about cleaning supermarkets offered me a position. And I remember telling Colleen, I think I'm going to take this job and, and uh, go work for these guys. They're out of uh, Fairfax, Virginia, and um, I can be on payroll. And when she said it, I remember saying, God, you really have been working in my life. She said, but you're the president of your own company. And, uh, and I remembered how insignificant that that moment was when she said, you get your business cars and you get your own company and this and that. And I remember thinking, that absolutely means nothing to me. I need to have health insurance and I need to have stable employment with a bigger company. And that's when I realized the work he had been doing all along. And so in the beginning of that job, I would drive by. Within a year, that dude that laid me off put that company out of business. And now he was because every time he was with me six months prior, he'd be calling, hey, Doreen, did you get my snowmobile in? And the next week, my new truck come in so I could see the writing on the wall. And when he laid me off, he's like, hey, we're all making a thousand bucks a week and, and I need to lay you off. And I'm like, dude, you've been here three months. I've been here three years. And he said, I know, we're top heavy and I gotta lay you off. So that's how I got done there. And I'm, I have to tell you, I've been a Christian for like seven or eight years at that time and I, I didn't even, I didn't step on nothing. I didn't step on nothing. Hey, 12 o'clock. All right, Paul Harvey, here's the rest of the story. So, anyways, uh, I, uh, okay, so anyways, um, I drove by, he ended up, after they put that company out of business, he ended up working at a car dealership that I had to pass every day to get to the interstate to go to work. And granted, on all these years, I've been in my car, I'm listening to AM radio station, God knew I didn't read a lot at the time, so every morning I would hear sermons from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m., and they were amazing. I used to say, God, how do you know what I'm going through? How is this speaking relevant to my life today? Not something yesterday or something five months from now, but today, how do you know that? And these guys keep coming on the radio station with what I need to hear, and it was the most amazing time ever, and, uh, except for my morning drive. I had to drive by where that dude worked, and I would... I would curse him out every time I would drive by there, thinking that he'd ruined my life and how could that have happened when I was doing what I did. I sacrificed my summer vacation to stay working and scheduling the cruise while they went through their divorce. And I just remember thinking, God, that's not right. I didn't know what he was doing to orchestrate my past. I didn't understand when we surrender to him, it doesn't look the way we think it's going to look. I always thought I was going to be in the shoe industry. I thought I was going to be retired in the shoe industry. I reached the pinnacle of my career. I was like, their dad, I'll show you. And then someday you're going to tell me you're proud of me. And uh, that wasn't what God had planned. God used that transition, that most painful time ever. Here my kids are with me. I can't provide for them. And this dude lays me off and I'm driving by there. You SOB, I'm glad you're out there shoveling all that snow off those 300 cars. I hope you have a freaking heart attack today. I mean, you can't imagine the stuff that I was cursing this guy out. That, I'm just telling you the truth. I mean, I couldn't even help myself. And then one of those pastors, five in the morning, 
He says, uh, you harboring resentment towards somebody else, your enemy, rather than praying for them, is like taking poison and thinking it's going to kill them. And I remember that just cut me to my heart. And I said, God, forgive me. I know in my own strength, I can't release forgiveness to him, but I need you to release forgiveness to that guy because I know I can't move beyond this. And he did. And I was able to release that forgiveness and, uh, and start praying for him, praying that God would bless his life and he would bless his health. And uh, got through that time, and the, the next transition was just working in the industry and um, working from Maine to Virginia down to Richmond. And our, I was on a motor. Uh, that was uh, when the kids were living with us. Gosh, I didn't. I knew, but I was in denial. Colleen had still been praying to have children, and I thought we got three. We're really good. We got a full house. And. Uh, <laughs> And so she was praying. One of those summers, I was on a motorcycle ride up towards the coast of Maine with her brothers. And she called me up and she said, uh, you're not going to believe it. I'm like, what? She's like, we're going to have a baby. I'm like, what are you talking about? We've been married eight years. How are we having a baby? She's like, we're having a baby. I'm like, okay. Um, all right. We'll see you when I get home. And uh, so, so that's when uh, she had Brianna. That was uh, almost 23 years ago. And uh, so two years later, I'm on the same motorcycle trip with her brothers. And she calls me and said, hey, you're never going to believe it. And I said, what? She said, we're going to have a baby. I'm like, what? <laughs> and that time I didn't say, okay. I said, I'm putting this bike into the next tree that I come up to. I'm not, I'm not doing this. And she said, no, it's going to be awesome. And that's when Tanner was born. So we went from zero to three to five. And uh, God was doing amazing things. Um, they were able to, uh, they started out at the church that we were going to with the older kids. And that was something that God's used in my testimony with guys, especially around here that had families. Because uh, when we moved here, we were like the oldest parents out of everyone. We were 50 and all of Tanner's friends were, you know, uh, they had kids Tanner's age. And, and then they had a couple of older ones in the 20s. Our older kids are 39, 38 and and 34 now so we had a big spread so they all thought we were their age and and the kids are going to school um or, or they're going to this church and they're going to a, a christian school but they didn't like this church because they'd become really old uh aged out the pastor's still there 50 years uh he's this amazing man of god but the church congregation they had no youth program um uh, they had several great youth pastors that our older kids were able to experience and go to camp and basketball and everything. So, um, and God will use other people to give you these nuggets every once in a while when you're really battling. Um, so um, she kept saying, why don't we let them go to church at the school that they go to, which was a vineyard. And I was like, no, this is where our older kids went. Our older son got married here. This is how a tradition is supposed to be. And then God used this guy that used to be a pastor that worked for me out in Tulsa. And uh, he said, you know, Rick, you can't look at it as changing pastors um, because of that loyalty. But you have to look at it as changing pastures. And there's seasons in our lives where God moves us to different pastures for ourselves, for our family, for our children. And, uh, and so I was able to get my head around that and said, yeah, so we, we made the transition. Um, and we started at this vineyard church. And that's where her and I started working with recovery because, um, you know, I don't volunteer for anything. I'm just going to tell you that right now. And she said, hey, uh, we're starting a recovery group. And uh, me and Lori, and, uh, and you should really go because those guys need to hear your testimony. I'm like, nobody needs to hear my testimony. I'm not going. And you have fun. So... <laughs> She, uh, she went there, she invited me, her brother was going to be there, so I went and I walked in the room and as a former addict, and, and you know, I knew that God had delivered me and I've never looked back from that. I've never gone back to cocaine, uh, any of the other drugs or alcohol uh, in the last 30 years. He has kept me from that uh, by his grace. 
And so I walk in, they got a circle of chairs, you know, my cynical mind, because I'm still only 10 years saved. You think I would have had more maturity than that, but I'd probably still think it today if I walked in here and I saw you guys in this circle, I'd be like, judge, jury, execution. The first thing that came to my head, I mean, I couldn't even help it. I'm like, judge, jury, execution. I'm not coming here. I'm not coming here saying, hi, I'm Rick, a recovered alcoholic. No, I'm not doing that crap. It's not happening. And so there I was, this, this recovery leader now, um, with, a, with, a, with a small men's group that I'm sharing with, and we go in, and you read the book, and hey, the sharing's amongst yourself. You're not here to fix him, him, or him. You're here to share about yourself. And then we have, a, and it became an amazing time uh, for me. Um, and then God was able to use the stuff that He had done, restoration in my lives, and those examples of praying about the band and him answering that prayer in three weeks, praying about the children, and that being seven years to the point where I finally came up to the altar one Sunday morning just weeping and saying, God, I am okay. Because we knew that we were such a mess when we got married. It was going to be a while before he would let the kids come back to us. We knew we had to work through a bunch of junk. And, uh, and so when I, when I remembered surrendering that, that day, that was when my son called and, and asked his mom if he could come live with us, and she said yes. Um, but uh, so now Tanner and Bree are here. We transition into the other church. We're working with recovery. Um, it was a good season in our life. We were there for almost 10 years. Um, Colleen was working with the women's groups and uh, sharing her testimony. And uh, I was working with the guys, and I remember giving my testimony at the, in the big auditorium with all the couples, and because of my quitting school and not ever liking school, and I still don't like to read, I, I'd rather listen and learn, listen, I can remember stories, um, but uh, I remember saying one night about, um, I never read, I actually have read two books in my whole life, and I've realized I really didn't read two, I only read one, Huckleberry Finn. I used to say I read two, one was Moby Dick, and then somebody showed me this book of Moby Dick, like this big, I'm like, yeah, I never read that book. <laughs> I, we, we did a book report, and I was in the picture with a big book on stage, and that's how I read Moby Dick, I guess. So um, I read one book. I bought a lot of books, thought I was going to read them on planes over the last 30 years, and um, I have to sleep on a plane, so I never read. But um, So anyways... I only got two more hours left? <laughs> Fifteen minutes. All right, so um, we go uh, through the season at the vineyard. Tanner and Bree are doing amazing. Uh, they're, she's driving to school every day. They're reading scripture. Um, uh, our lives are, are getting in order. Uh, I'm now with this company going on uh, oh, six years. They became a publicly traded company. I became a regional manager. I was traveling. Uh, seven or eight states. Um, I was gone a tremendous amount uh, the first many, many years of our marriage, the last 10 flying every week. Um, missed a lot of things, but um, it was a different season for us, and uh, we were just having a great time at this vineyard church. It was uh, a good season, and then um, the school closes. I had wanted to put the house on the market and get out of the snow a year previous, and Bree had a fit and didn't want us to take us from her friends and her church and her school. So we said, okay. But, and I remember saying to her, just remember, sometimes God works in ways that we don't understand and it doesn't look the way we think it's going to look. And then I go sit in the hot tub and say, God, you know, if you want us to move, would you, would you send us a shooting star or something like that? And don't ever pray that prayer. That's the dumbest thing on the world, okay? <laughs> I'm just going to tell you right now, don't pray that prayer. Because a shooting star came and what's my next prayer? God, was that really you or was that going to happen? If, if that was going to happen, would you do one more of those so that I really know that it's you? That never happens, okay? So don't, that's just a stupid way to pray. <laughs> but he, um, he started moving our hearts, and um, when I had mentioned it, I would have definitely been a villain um, because I would have taken our kids from their, their favorite places, and uh, it just wasn't the right timing. So I was okay with that. God really started to speak to my heart and just gave me a piece about staying, what, what we were doing. And so um, I came home in March, and, and they're all crying. And I'm like, what are you guys crying about? Look like somebody just passed away. He said, well, they just announced today that they're closing a the school in June. And I'm like, really? That's pretty awesome. And <laughs> I didn't say that because they would have thought I was mean, but I was thinking that. And so 
I'm like, what's going on? And this is the only time I can remember in 30 years that I've ever said anything with any wisdom to my wife because she's light years ahead of me. And guys, if you're in a relationship with a wife that's light years ahead of you, you may harbor a little resentment from time to time thinking that they're, I, I always say she lives up in this little celestial area and I'm like way down here. Um, this is the only time I can really recall speaking any wisdom to her that God imparted on me. Um, because she was so angry with the pastor and the assistant pastor because their children had all gone through the school. The school had been open 17 years, and she thought our kids were going to go to school their entire uh, school life there, and uh, it didn't work out. And I remember um, them saying the reason they were closing was because there was only 100 students and they, they couldn't maintain. They used to have 150, 200 in their heyday. And that year, the assistant pastor's uh, daughter graduated, and they decided to m move it into more of a college ministry for, uh, for the Vineyard College program that they had. So she was walking around, I mean, PO'd, and she wanted to go give them the business. And I said, look, I said, you guys have been walking and praying around that school every day. Every day, they'd be out there in the ice, the cold, the baking sun. Every day, they, her and a few ladies that she had in her group would walk and pray over the students, over that school, over the teachers. I said, don't you think if God wanted to send 500 kids to this school, he would send them? And she didn't say nothing. She said shortly after that, God told her, take your hands off of this. I'm moving you. And uh, so that's when all the hot tub prayers started, because now we know we're moving. We don't have a school. Um, we have no clue where we're going. And, uh, and I'm doing my hot tub magic, you know, asking God where we're going. I knew we were going, but I didn't know where. And... Uh, <laughs> We're on a motorcycle ride, uh, her and I going up to Freeport, Maine, and uh, she had bounced, you know, some ideas. God usually softens me up so I don't act like such an idiot when I respond on something. Because normally she'd be like, well, let's go to, you know, um, out to uh, Nevada. That's where my niece and nephew live, and they love it. I'm like, of course they love it. It's freaking 90 degrees and it's December. They're going to love it. But in the summertime, they're going to be 105. They're going to hate it. And they're going to combust and they won't like it. And, and so, uh, so the Vegas idea was out and they did move back to Maine in June when they couldn't get in their pool because it was too hot. And, uh, but we went through this time and it was just a real lot of anxiety. And I knew when God would answer, it'd be a, a peaceful thing. And she's on the back of the motorcycle and she says, what about Tennessee? And I'm thinking, I was thinking like Florida, the Carolinas. And I, but my answer was, yeah, that might work. And God had given me enough familiarity because now six years into this other job with this national company out of Virginia, when they became publicly traded, um, the guys that they bought all these small two, three, five million dollar companies had two year non-compete agreements. And they were all starting companies up in their wives' names and other people's names. And so anyways, uh, I knew it wasn't going to be around long. So I contacted this guy that I knew through the owner of my other company and said, hey, I'm looking for a job. And he said, yeah, come down and talk to me. And I was going to, I'm an operations guy. I've been running operations all this time. And he said, I need somebody to, uh, to run sales. And I took a pay cut, took the job, went there. And uh, that was kind of the beginning. And God did some amazing things because I was so reliant on him for everything that was going to happen in our lives. And I just said, God, I can't do this without you. I don't know how to sell. This is not a product. It's not a machine. This is a service. And but he opened some amazing doors over the next uh, couple years, and I was able to sell a couple million dollars worth of business each year. And the company grew and grew and uh, went from a $13 million company to $25 million to uh, now today we do about $70 million because of the COVID cleaning. But we're about a $60 million company. And it's been through relying on him and being able to share that with all the guys that I work with. When we lose an account, when we gain an account, um, we're, that's kind of how we talk is, you know, that was a door that God opened or that was something he probably protected us from. Um, but now uh, we're looking to transition to move someplace. And he wants me to move closer to our office in Boston and I just don't want to be there. She says Tennessee and I'm like, okay, because during that time, we had been cleaning Centennial Medical Center and Skyline. We still do uh, the medical office side of those businesses after 18 years. And so I remember thinking, yeah, I know the West End. I know a little bit where I go every month or every three months. And so we started looking. And long story short, she looked at Murfreesboro and some other places and found Hendersonville Christian Academy. And so we uh, came down, looked at that, looked at a house that was three times more expensive than our old house. 
Um, her and my daughter had more faith than I did because I'm just like, this is not going to work. We're going to be house poor. And, you know, God did some amazing things there with her never using her VA loan from being in the military to the interest rates and the taxes being way cheaper than back home. And we moved here, saved $500 a month, found an amazing Christian school, found Long Hollow, started going there. Um, life, is, life is moving along. We don't know anybody in town. And she says, hey, uh, Pastor David used to talk about, uh, you know, having small groups at your house because they were running out of room at the, on campus. And she said, I'm going to sign you up for a small group leader. I'm like, no, hell, you're not. Um, and, and so once again, there we are in this big auditorium. I'm going to be a small group leader. And uh, it, was like, it was like the Rudolph Christmas movie with Misfit Island. We're in a circle. I'm thinking, God, this is amazing. Nobody's showing up, and we're going to be getting out of here really quick. And all of a sudden, all these people start showing up. And they're, they're like, hey, we saw your name in the directory. Do we know you, Rick Sturgis? I'm like, no, uh, we just moved here. We don't know anybody. And all these people started coming. I think we had like 12 couples. Um, and next thing you know, you know, we got these couples coming to our house every, every uh, Wednesday night. And for me, it was like a grilling opportunity, eating opportunity, whatever. For her, it was a little bit more like cleaning up and work. But we did it for three years, and these people were amazing. They all became dear friends, and I loved the guys. Uh, they became my brothers, and uh, we, just, we just had a terrific relationship. And so uh, three years into it, uh, she decides she's going to work with a woman uh, who had had children uh, that have been suicidal or lost children because she had lost her, her son. Uh, from a car accident back in 2005 and so that was her heart at the time and uh, I remember telling her you just ruined my life you know this this is not even right we this I would I didn't want to do this now I'm doing it and I like it and now you're taking it away and again just like all the other jobs and all the other circumstances that God had ordained throughout that whole time to move us in different places through different seasons um, I normally do a 20 mile a day pedal ride up through White House and I would be out there arguing with God, like God, you know, that woman you gave me, she just ruined my life and uh, I don't have any friends here and I don't know anybody here and this, this is so stupid. And uh, he started to deal with me and it was quickly and he said, I want you to open up a cigar shop. And I just told him how stupid that idea was really quick. I said, I know it goes against everything the churches stand for. It goes against everything uh, publicly uh, accepted, not accepted. It's, it's not it's sociable. It's nothing. It's, and, but it wouldn't go away. It was relentless. And that's usually how he deals with me is overwhelmingly re relentless to where I just have to give up and stop kicking and screaming. I'm like, all right, whatever, God. But it was, again, about three weeks into that where I was just seeking him that uh, I woke up and it was just as clear as getting out of the band. It wasn't any big voice. He didn't say, Rick, you know, I'm Luke, your father, and this is what you're going to do. He just, said, he just said, hey, uh, this is not about... So God's pretty creative, and I have traveled so many years, and I always try to make a point to buy people's lunch. I'll just tell you this quick story, because he allows me to think that I have him figured out, and my old pastor, I think Brad told me it too, is um, let God be God and you just be Rick because everything is way above your pay grade. But I'm sitting in a restaurant in, uh, in, uh, in Houston uh, at a Grand Lux Cafe. I had just been to Joel Osteen's church that morning, and I'm on the phone with her after church, and I see this young couple walking that would have been like our middle son's age with a little girl in a, and wrapped up in his sports coat, and they said grace, and I just thought it was the coolest thing, and I just admired them as I was eating lunch, and God started dealing with me. I want you to buy those people's lunch, and I'm like, I do that all the time. I can do that. He said, I want you to tell them that you're buying their lunch. I'm like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> not, not happening. <laughs> So the next hour, me and him are doing this banter, uh, as we do, and I'm like, God, I'm not going to do that. It's going to look presumptuous. They're going to think I'm an idiot. So now I have to rationalize what God's big picture is. I'm like, well, we do a lot of work here. Maybe it's meant that our paths are going to cross, and this guy's going to work for me as one of my, because by now I'm the vice president of this company that I've been with for whatever it was back then, 10, 11 years. Um, and uh, so I... I said, all right, God, whatever. That's my normal final straw. Like, all right, whatever, God, I'll do it. And uh, isn't it cool that he doesn't, he already knows how we are. Yeah. I mean, he didn't wake up and say, man, I really freaked up with Rick that day, didn't I? I mean, 
it's not like it's not like he wakes up and doesn't see it coming and he's like, oh, I thought he was going to do it better than that. But no, he knows. But he still uses us if at the end of it we're willing to surrender and be used by him. And so even a knucklehead like me, I go over and I'm like, hey, I don't know why. Me and God have been sitting over here arguing for the last hour and he wants me to buy your lunch. I was going to buy it, but he wants me to tell you that he told me to buy your lunch. I said, I'm thinking maybe it's for our path to cross that we're going to work together. I, I have some regional positions open. And I give the guy my card and they looked at me in such amazement. I'm like, dude, it's like 40 bucks. I mean, this ain't a big deal. And little did I know when I came home, Colleen had gotten a letter in the mail, but I'd also gotten an email from this kid. And uh, that's the things that humble you when you know that God can even use someone like me and how he restores our lives and helps restore other people's lives. But those people weren't even from that area. All the things I thought in my head that they had been at church while I was over there, that they lived there, we might work together. It was not even the case. They were three hours away from home. They had come in for his, uh, his wife's uncle had just passed away. They were there for a funeral. Um, he had lost his aunt like uh, a month before that. And five or six months before that, they had lost a, an infant baby girl. <laughs> I remember thinking, God, how would you use me for something like that? And they wrote a letter saying, you have no idea what it meant for you to come up and tell us that God was there and telling you to buy our lunch because we had been wondering in the last six months where he was with the death of our daughter. And now we know he's never left us. And so my wife ruined my life with a small group. And... Uh, <laughs> And I'm arguing with God about this whole, this whole cigar thing. And then I wake up one morning and he says, this is not about cigars. This is going to be a vehicle that brings men together, um, that you will have community and fellowship and lives will be changed because of your testimony and their testimony. And that's just going to be the vehicle that brings you together. It's not about a business, not about money. It's not about profit. And uh, I have some amazing brothers, several of them here today, Kevin and Jerry and Dewey. And, uh, and they know our wives are our backbone and our supporters. We talk about our wives being our heroes. Um, it's, uh, it's been an amazing thing. But we opened that shop four years ago. Our first year, um, six guys were saved and baptized there. Um, we, uh, uh, my accountability partner, Jack, said we need to be deliberate and basically like get the band back together because we had talked after our couples group ended and we said let's get our guys group together let's start doing something and it, nothing lent itself to Starbucks or Panera just when you talk about the intimate things that we talk about in our testimonies it needs to be in a place that people can feel comfortable protected and shared uh, privately confidentially and so the cigar shop opens and we started a small group and we've never missed a Saturday or Tuesday in the last four years um, we have dozens of pastors that uh, come up and hang out with us and share. Brad comes up and does a men's message on occasions on a, uh, now that we get the outdoor deck so he doesn't have to sit in the smoke. Um, but God has used even something like that to build community and restore lives uh, in a different season in my life now that almost 60 I can share and, and sow into other guys' lives. Um, but it's just amazing to see what he's done and see the transition in men's lives and how they impact my life still uh, as my walk. But without our wives, without our family, we realize how frail we are, no matter how big we are and how tough we think we are. Um, we know where our support comes from, obviously, uh, from our Heavenly Father first, but he's given us amazing spouses to, uh, to endure the ride and to share the ride. And um, I know I couldn't do it without my wife. And, um, I never said that to her before, but I'm saying it now. I couldn't do it without you. Amen. And so we're here. We, we've been going along hollow eight years, and then Bree starts coming over here, and we're like, what are you doing? You know, you're breaking up, you're breaking up the band, and we got this good thing going on. And she comes here, we hear all the horror stories, and I'm like, I'm staying as far away from that place as possible. 
And uh, God wooed me in. Colleen started coming over. Um, God wooed me in. And I came in and just um, felt like I was home again. Amen. And, And uh, it's been an amazing blessing to be here, to see the same people and the church grow from where it's been. And I'm just glad that he brought me here. And uh, I just love all you guys. And uh, thank you for having me.